And welcome to the Reason and Theology Show, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Lofton. Wednesday night, doing a show here with co-host uh, William Albrecht. Eric Ibar is going to be joining us here shortly, and also our guest, Dr. Matthew J. Thomas. How are you, Dr. Thomas? Great to have you on. Um, great. That was real snazzy. I've never seen that before. <laughs> All the music and sound lights. I, I don't know. If You've been working podcast. on it, so this, I appreciate that. This is, this is definitely the most high-tech podcast I've I've been on before. I feel I feel like this is a step a step up for for me. So anyway, I'm, <laughs> well, I I'm impressed already. I, I appreciate that. I've I've put in a little bit of time into it. So <laughs> glad, glad somebody noticed. Well, anyways, let me go ahead and introduce you, and uh, then we're going to dive in, Doctor Matthew J. Thomas. Um, Doctor of Philosophy from the University of Oxford is Assistant Professor of Biblical Studies at the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology in Berkeley, California, and an instructor in theology with Regent College, Vancouver. And we're discussing his book today. If y'all can see it on here on the screen, uh, Paul's Works of the Law in the Perspective of Second Century Reception. So this is going to be a really, really fun one. And by the way, like I was telling you, you know, before we went live. You got some really heavy hitters who endorse this thing. If, if y'all aren't familiar with it, check it out. You have Douglas Moo endorsing it, N.T. Wright, Alistair McGrath, Matthew Levering. I saw Curtis Mitch um, on here. Uh, you got some big names. So you, you, you have their ear, it seems. How, how did you... Uh, how did you get their attention, first of all, is what I'm, <laughs> I'm curious about. Well, that's a great question. I'm, I feel like I'm still sort of wondering that myself, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I think that this probably has less less to do with, with me and just, I think, more with, with the material in, yeah. in the book. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think because... Uh, because the debates between the you know the old and, and, and new perspectives, I think, have uh, you know in, in some ways kind of kind of stagnated, and you had your your battle lines and everything. Yeah. Um, I think that having a, a different approach to it, and and you know looking at the the early church's understanding of this and saying, hey, how does this you know how does this line up? Well, first off, you know, what are they actually, you know, what are they saying? Yeah. Uh, and then how does this line up with what we're calling the the old and, and new perspectives on Paul? And then, you know, finally, if you take that early reception material, how does that, what what light would this seem to shed on on Paul's epistles and what's actually happening in his in his, his, his context? You know, I, I think that, I think that having that material there is, uh, it's just really, it's, it's just really interesting for, you know, for folks. And I, and I put myself at the front of that list, you know, because this, this book isn't really my ideas. It's me going through and, you know, trying to listen as closely as possible and as much detail to the old new perspectives. Yeah. And then going through as, you know, as meticulously as I can through the, you know, the early, early sources in the church and trying to say, hey, you know, what, what, what do they say through all this? And then trying to syn synthesize that. And I think that, you know, the, the upshot is hopefully, that at the end of the day, you know, we look at the earlier reception material, and we just and we come back to Paul's epistles, and we just find, hey, I, I feel like I understand these a lot better. What's what's happening? I, I know I know for myself that's 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 absolutely been been the case, and so I think for for some of the readers that that are and the folks who are who are engaged uh, with these kind of debates and who have you know been exposed to this this early patristic material, I think that it's you know the enthusiasm probably comes from having a. Uh, you know, a, a similar experience uh, to what, you know, what, what I've had an encounter in these other sources. So and, that's, you know, that's, that's my, my best bet, my guess. I've also, I, I'll go in, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I found in general, uh, you know, uh, when you're in Oxford, I found, this is a fun game I started playing for when I first got there. When you have a, an, a, an Oxford email address, you find that anybody in the world will go and respond to your email. So I was on the front end. I was like, oh, I wonder what the scholar thinks about this. Or I can really use this take on this. Well, guess what? Everybody goes and responds to this email address within like 30 minutes. And so, uh, <laughs> so I think that, that probably helped as far as. Um, but, I, but I'll tell you, no, I, I agree with you. I think it's the, the, the content itself that really got their attention. Because when I'm looking through this, this is incredible. And, you know, I understand this is your doctoral dissertation, but it doesn't even read like one. And, and it, it it's looks like it's formatted in such a way that it's written in a very friendly manner. So, um, you know, nobody out there should feel intimidated. 
it has been modified um, to be very, very friendly uh, in the way that it reads. And, and I've appreciated that greatly. Um, so I think it's very accessible, but the content is extremely, extremely on point. So I think that's really what got their attention there. Now, the first thing that I saw as soon as I opened the book up, uh, just to go down a little bit of a rabbit trail here, was uh, for Nabil Qureshi, you know, right there at the front. And that that really caught my eye um, <clears throat> because Nabil, you know, for those of uh, of y'all who aren't familiar, he was a apologist, a Christian apologist for Muslims. And in fact, he, he used to be a Muslim and then he converted. And, uh, you know, it, I've, I've seen a lot of his good his content online. It is very, very good, very helpful. I want to direct everybody to it. And um, I understand he was a really good good guy. I know William knows him and um, you, you knew him as well. So tell us just a little bit about him and why you dedicated this book to him. I, I think that would be worth exploring. Yeah. Um, so at, uh, I'm, 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 I'm glad I guess I had a chance to, you know, be, you know, get to know him, be, be exposed to his, you know, his, his stuff. He came uh, to, to Christchurch. Uh, so the, the college at Oxford, uh, I, was, I was at. Uh, he came. He came there uh, after my first my first year, and so we we overlapped for, for two years over there. And um, I was assigned as his uh, his graduate parent at, at Christ Church at, at, our, at our college. So it's just kind of like, hey, you're gonna show this guy around and everything. And so that was that was where I got got to know him, and or uh, you know initially he he he, he and Michelle um, and. Uh, I had no clue who he was. I had no idea he hadn't written a book or anything like that. And so mm -hmm. the first day we met, we just had him over. And was like, wow, you know, he's a really, really neat guy. And then just over the next, uh, you know, over the next next year, I got to know him better and better, spent more and more time together. And then, uh, then we just got to a point where we're, we're together, you know, every, every day we would go. Uh, so so he and I and uh, my, my other friend, uh, whose name is Shifty, uh, his name isn't actually Shifty, it's actually Alex. Everybody calls him, calls him Shifty. Uh, we would, he was, he was, he was uh, doing uh, a PhD in, in physics. And so we, we would all go to this, this, uh, this really, really cheap coffee shop. It was actually a restaurant that would give you uh, coffee for one pound, uh, unlimited. Up, and this was up until like 1 p.m. And so we'd go upstairs wow. there and just pound bad coffee together. <laughs> and we'd go and uh, then, you know, go, go to lunch together. We just, we, we were just together every, every day working. And, um, and yeah, I mean, he, he was, you know, he, he was, he was my, my closest friend over there. Just awesome, awesome guy. And so, uh, so, you know, my wife and I, my wife Leanne, and, and you know, we had, you know, we had our daughter Camille over there and then uh, he and Michelle had an eye. And so we would all, you know, we'd, we'd get together. I was actually, um, I was I was Aya's first you know babysitter way way back in the day uh, when they 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 uh, needed to just have you know have, have a babysitter and stuff so we got we were real you know really close with them mm. and um, and yeah so we were uh, we we were actually when when the news the news broke of when he he, he found out about you know the cancer and all that, we were uh, uh, we were, we were just moving into their place actually because they they weren't weren't in weren't in, in England they're back in the states. So we were staying temporarily in, in their flat. And so we ended up having to go and to move, uh, you know, we, yeah, we went and we sent uh, all their, all their stuff back to the, to the States and stuff. And then um, he, he actually came and came and visited us. This was, um, I mean, gosh, this is this tough, tough memory. Just, I, I just, I miss this guy so, yeah. so much. Yeah. Um, he, uh, he came, came and visited us. Um, this is at the, at the end of April, in 2017 so this is just before i believe it was a couple days before he got you know sort of the results back that the new the new treatment they didn't give him wasn't 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 working mm. um and that it, yeah it, it, things had just gone gone the wrong direction with the, with the treatment um, he came and came and visited us uh he and, he and um, michelle and i uh, just just before that got here in california and um, guys, I'm going to tell a story. This is who this guy is. We were, we were over here and we didn't have an internet router at our house. We just, we had, we had an internet router. We like, you need to have an internet router. Like, you know that you could just, you know how easy it is to get an internet router. I'm like, yeah, we just don't really end up getting around. He's like, all right, well, we're going to get you an internet router. And so we spent like hours in this afternoon. This guy has like, you know, a terminal cancer thing. And he's like, I want to spend 
you know, literally hours driving around with you to go, you know, we had to go to multiple stores and go to try to find an internet, you know, an internet router. And so, um, if you, if you come, come by our place, uh, it's, uh, our, our, our network is called, um, uncle Beal's internet cafe because uh, our daughter called, um, called Nabil uncle, uncle Beal. And, uh, that was, that's just who this guy is. Um, you know, yeah. it, it's, uh, yeah. You know, I, I learned a lot from his content when I was preparing for um, a uh, discussion with Dr. Shabira Lee. But what I found more impressive than his content was a couple videos that I saw of him after he was already given the news about him and he having cancer and he's, you know, laying there in the hospital and you can tell, I mean, he's, you know, he's going through a lot physically and, uh, I was most impressed by the way he handled it, his faith in God in that hour, you know, pretty much hours before he died, it seems. He's doing videos telling everybody to, you know, uh, stay strong, continue to believe in Christ. And, you know, he, he was just he, he clearly was being very optimistic, uh, trusting in Christ. Um, that was just very inspirational. And that, I think that was even more impressive than the quality of his content, the yeah. quality of his character. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I was really, <clears throat> really glad when I saw that. Yeah, um, he's, a, he's a, just an incredible, incredible guy. And I've yeah. never, um, yeah. I mean, I've told, I told you this, this Michael, I've, I've never had somebody who, you know, who, who I've, I've lost who is, uh, has been, yeah. been, been hired in this. And just, just from a standpoint of just, just missing somebody. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just the, the the quality of the guy, how much how much fun fun you had together, yeah. and um, so anyway, this is I mean he was yeah he was the oddest person, and, and we you know we had, we talked about all this all this material you know lots lots as well, and so yeah. um, I remember asking you know, my wife, it's I mean I think especially for a dissertation, it's like if you don't dedicate it to your, to your wife, you're kind of dead, um, because you know, his life's like, you know put up. She with was it. okay with it. Oh, I, you know, absolutely. Yeah. She was, yeah. I think she, she, yeah, if there was any, anybody, you know, bes, bes, yeah, I, she wouldn't let me do it besides anything besides the right. deal because, um, yeah, I mean, well, just, that's, so, that's so awesome. Close. And and I encourage everybody to pray for the repose of his soul. He was, he was a good man. I never knew him, but just from what I could see, uh, in the content of his character, you know, in the moment of his death, having that kind of faith and, uh, hope, is very very telling uh but let, let's dive in let's get into it um you know one of the questions that i have is and of course this is what you're addressing at the very beginning the old perspective on paul <laughs> and the new perspective on paul for those of us who aren't familiar with those terms and concepts explain to us what exactly is the old perspective and then what is the new perspective or new perspectives however you yeah want. absolutely so i can i can give you a quick quick rundown uh, I don't, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, bore, bore you guys with this, but uh, speaking broadly, it, the old perspective on Paul tends to go, hey, there's another person here. Yeah, Eric's joining us. How are you, don't, Eric? Uh, I'm doing well. Don't mind me. Keep going. All right. So I'm this, I'm telling what the old perspective and the new perspective on Paul is. So if any of this is wrong, go on and throw up, throw up all your objections and correct, correct me afterwards. So. Uh, that, so the, the the old perspective on Paul, you know, usually goes and traces it, itself back to you know to, to Luther and Calvin, to, to the reformers, and then to the the stream of uh, Pauline interpretation that goes and follows from from them. And uh, so that's you know in New Testament studies, if you if you're thinking you know most of the, the period up until you know really this 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 past century is uh, kind of the dominant uh, you know paradigm within within New Testament studies, and that's partially just because. And, you know, New Testament studies as a as a separate academic discipline is you know is pretty fundamentally a Protestant discipline. If you're just thinking, you know, studying these things in isolation or just studying kind of just Pauline studies um, and not you know other other kinds of studies. So um, so that's that's kind of been uh, what has you know that's kind of carried the day in most uh, most academic and, and ecclesial context. I think from a Protestant st standpoint um, and. What it does in in, in looking at uh, looking at Paul and his his debates, it tends to go and to see them in terms of uh, if, 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 you know what's 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 Paul arguing for, what's he arguing against, 
Mm-hmm. It tends to be in terms of you know, much, you know, much like Luther said with his own opponents in the, in the 16th century. So when, you know, when Luther is talking, uh, you know, about kind of works righteousness and legalism, those, those, those sorts of things, those are the same kinds of things that he goes and identifies Paul and his Jewish opponents mm-hmm. going and, and, and dealing, dealing with as well. So if you're looking at the question that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking at works of the law, um, which, uh, you know, as, as far as I can tell, I, I got into works of the law because as, as I was going back and forth and trying to get a sense of, hey, the old perspective, new perspective, where do these sides line up? Where do they diverge? It was really the works of the law that I just kept running into that seemed like it, it had the, the biggest difference there. And it was kind of the, the key the key hinge uh, issue. So mm-hmm. Luther, in his interpretation, you know, he tends to you know, look at works of the law as just kind of any 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 works, good works, uh, whatever you know, whatever, whatever whatever works you want to fill fill in there. Uh, he um, he, he uses uh, is uh, you know, a gloss that he has in his uh, his open letter and translating, which I think is is either fifteen thirty. 1531. I forget off the top of my head, but it's, it's really interesting doc, documents. It's a, it's a wild ride too. It's just if you want some really characteristic Luther stuff, you get that's a good good spot to, to go for it. You, you know, he 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 does a gloss and he calls them good works of the law, um, and so uh, that is that's the, the, what he what he thinks Paul and his you know Judaizing opponents are, are talking about and. As far as what are you doing when you're doing these good works? Well, what's you know what's signified by this? Well, at a kind of individualistic level, you're trying to earn salvation. You're trying to earn merit before God. And so, it's a if if you kind of think of the you know the legalist ladder and trying to, to to climb climb your way up as an individual, uh, that's you know that's that's an image that I think fairly describes what the significance of of works of the law uh, are within within the the, the old perspective. So that's there's um you know I won't get into the differences between Luther and, and Calvin you know right now at the kind of base level if you want to get get in, into that those are those are really interesting but just in general that's that's what the the old perspective tends to be, uh, tends to portray how it tends to portray you know Paul and his 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 debates um, and yeah just the way that all that all that goes and works the new perspective on Paul is. Uh, he traces back to 1977 uh, with with E.P. Sanders and mm-hmm. his uh, work Paul and Palestinian Judaism, and he goes and he looks at what is being called the you know what or I, I, nobody was calling it the old perspective at the time, but it was just kind of the dominant perspective that was around. And he he just goes and looks at that in terms of the Palestinian Judaism that you have in in Christ sometimes. So he looks at all these you know early Jewish you know, sources that we have, and he just says what Luther is talking about. Uh, in, in what he's identifying as being the you know, the things in question between Paul and his Jewish interlocutors, he just says, you just can't find anything like this within the early sources. You just can't find Jews who are talking like this uh, within, within this period. Um, and what he says is, it, it seems like what Luther's doing said is that he's sort of projecting his critiques of the late medieval you know church mm-hmm. onto Paul and his opponents. And so, you know, what the, the the abuses he finds in the late medieval church that's what the judaizers are doing that's the bad thing and then what you know what paul is doing well that's what you know he luther is doing that's the good that's kind of the good the good the good thing um and so sanders says hey whatever you whatever you think of uh you know luther versus the, you know the late medieval catholic church that's not what's happening in this, in this historical context uh, when uh, you know what what the Judaizers are doing is they're they're not trying to get people to do to do good works. They're not trying to go and say uh, again fill in fill in the blank with whatever you know good works you want. Uh, and it's not some sort of general moral law that they're trying to get people to adhere to or some sort of like you know legalism. If you're looking at you know the, the context, these kinds of debates about works of law, are, it's about the you know the Torah in particular. So whether or not. Uh, you know, a, a, a Gentile is going to have to go and to, to obey the Torah. And within that, he says, there's always certain practices that go and come up, circumcision, food laws, Sabbath keeping, those, those kinds of things. And the reason that they always come up is because the significance of them. When you go and you practice these works, you become a Jew. You become a, a part of the Jewish nation, a part of the Jewish Jewish covenant. Uh, and, and so uh, from Sanders' standpoint, it seems obvious that what's going on here isn't something individualistic. It's not, 
uh, hey, you know, how many how many points do I get for circumcision? Is that like seven points? How many points do I get for you know observing this food law? Because I need to get I need to get to ten points. That's the it, or you know fill in fill in the blank. However however you want to uh, however many points you think that that that, that, that we need. So that you just says that's 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 crazy. Uh, that sort of individualistic uh, you know look at things. That that's just not what that's not what what Jews believe. That's not, nobody nobody goes and thinks in those kinds of ways. When you when you're circumcised, when you you know obey the you know the, the food laws and uh, in the related days of the the Jewish calendar, you're becoming part of the Jewish nation, and that's significant because you know the the Jews are God's people in that context, and so this isn't uh, this isn't some sort of you know random like hey sort of pick a people. It's like no, God has picked a people, and this is that's why this is so 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 important. Um, and so you can say there's a a communal significance to works of the law within this, this new perspective, uh, as, you know, as, as articulated by, by, by Sanders. And so you've had since, since then, since 77, uh, you've had these, these back and forth between, between all the new, new perspectives. And, um, you know, most people are familiar with the new perspective, not, not from, from Sanders, but either from, uh, from James Dunn, or, or, or I think even more from, from N.T. Wright. And it's really N.T. Wright more than any, anybody else who has, uh, I think has, has, you know, popularized this, 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 this kinds of material. And that's, that's involved in a lot of context going and taking on some, you know, pretty, pretty important, I think, um, you know, Protestant assumptions. And so there's been a lot of back and forth and kind of, uh, you know, I don't know if you want to use the word warfare, if that's, that's maybe a little, a little, a little too, too strong, but definitely within, um, you know, if you want to take, you know, Presbyterian denominations, for example, you know, there's certain Presbyterian denominations that you come across and they're just, they're totally fine with interior. So this is great. And you know, it, it's interesting you're mentioning that because I'm thinking of the federal vision, which, which started here in the city that I'm in. Uh, oh, okay. Avenue. So gotcha. um, they were very much into some of that material and they're, they're yeah. very comfortable with the new perspective. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, I imagine it, that's who you have in mind. <laughs> yeah. So, so you, you, have, you have those. You you also have those of a. Um, I mean, if, if you just want to say, you know, you know more uh, less uh, less traditional Presbyterians, and so whether that's whether that's uh, you know kind of you know more liberal Presbyterians, whether this is just more kind of generally evangelical Presbyterians who aren't particularly uh, enthusiastic about Calvin to to begin with. I mean, I, know I have a lot of roots in uh, you know con context like that. Um, they're fine with right, and they'll you know they, you know preach right every Sunday, and, and that's and it just it makes more sense of, of the text uh, you know to them. So in a lot of contexts, it's, it's you know that this, this 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 new perspective has 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 won the day. There's other contexts which you can say you know more traditional Presbyterian you know, con contexts uh, where you're going to have real big issues with this because it means questions. Hey, this if this goes against you know these central tenets of the Reformation. How are we going to go and trading, you know, Calvin for, you know, for right? Um, and so there's, you know, there's, 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 there's good, good, you know, kind of tectonic questions that are brought up. So, so my introduction, you know, for a lot of this is yeah, the there was, well, I don't know, it's probably 15 years ago. These books are written, but the 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 John Piper and T Wright books that were, went went back and forth. That was that was my my first introduction to to all this, and the first stuff that I wrote on as a as a master's student about a decade ago. But the the new perspective is effectively. Correct me if I'm wrong. Questioning the entire reason for the Reformation, is that right? Boy, you're trying to get me killed here, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> These are the conversations we have here on our team. Ah, boy. This is the thing about us: we have Catholic contributors, Orthodox contributors, and Protestant contributors. We even have yeah. some non-Christian contributors. We're yeah. talking about all the tough stuff that people don't want to talk about. I love it. I love it. Well, I'll take that as a yes that you're trying to get me killed, Michael. Um, the uh, no, I think I think you're right. I, I mean, I think that there, this this it's 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 tectonic material. I, I don't think that there's there's a way around that. I think it yeah. is. Uh, I, I think I think that's that's yeah, that's I mean, the reality, which is which is part of I mean, for you know, from my from my own study uh, and engaging this this material and saying, hey, how does the early church you know relate to all this? Yeah, I think part of the reason why you have such such stalemate here is. Is it's just because it's so it's so important. 
Yeah. Uh, it's it's so it's so important for you know different kinds of ecclesial identity and things things like that. And so from my standpoint, trying to go into to read the early material and to uh, just pass it along as, as as faithfully as as I can. I think the hope is say, it, it, can we can we try to help to build some some common ground, you know, be between between these sides. Um, and you know, in, in doing so, you know, it's it's funny because. Uh, you know, the inspiration for a lot of it, 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 it comes from more traditional Protestant sources. And so, you know, I was, uh, I, yeah, right, right before I, I went and I wrote the initial paper on, on, on this topic in 2011, uh, that then sort of became an article, which then became the, you know, the, the dissertation and, you know, at least the, the, the books that have come out. Um, I had, I had read, read through, uh, John Piper's critique of, of N.T. Wright on justification. Oh, yeah. So I, so I, gone, I, I gone through yeah, yeah. So I I gone through those 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 two books. It was actually for 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 J.I. Packer. I wrote a, a paper that was an assessment of, of the the two the, the two books, which is it was a great exercise. It was really disorienting, but it was really it was really good. And it's interesting in seeing um, the you know the appeals that Piper had to you know the wisdom of the centuries. There's a uh, there's, there, there's 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 a page where three times he goes and he says you know. Right needs to appreciate the wisdom of the centuries I know on this on this, on this issue um and you can't you know just this desire for novelty is not is not healthy it's not not good for you know for anybody it's the wisdom of the centuries that's here and so I'm, so I'm thinking I well you know as soon as I had this idea people were like well wisdom of the centuries are uh you know he, later on in the book he goes and talks about how you know he's contrasting you know right with Luther and Calvin he says well Luther and Calvin at least tried to go and link up their writings with those of the church fathers. And, mm. you know, Wright doesn't seem to care about that. He just kind of wants to, you know, he must, he must be new, be brand new. Um, and so for, for me, you know, and I, I just, I just come across, you know, all this, 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 this kind of stuff from, you know, some, some, some like Piper. And um, I mean, I can, I can just throw, throw this, the anecdote in here. Uh, uh, because I'll probably say no, no, but the way I got started on this was actually from from Calvin's commentary on Romans, and so yeah. you know I had I had this this material from from Piper in the back of my head, and uh, when I had taken uh, Dr. Packer's theology class, I read a, a bunch of Calvin. Uh, he has a bunch of primary source uh, material, which is which is really good. And uh, so I got so used to reading Calvin and just reading the way that he cites the church fathers, you know, on every, every page over and over, whenever there's a disputed question, even if it's barely disputed, he goes and he, you know, he brings all the church fathers with him. And even if it's something where you're like, I don't really know if that church father exactly says that or precisely agrees with your point, he still goes and makes, makes appeal to them. And so I, I gotten so used to that from, from reading the Institute's. And so I was um, I was writing a paper for another class on on the question of works of the law just because it seemed from you know from what I'd done read the, the Piper and Wright books it really seemed like that was the, this this hinge question and I got to uh, his his line on Romans three twenty which is what what the book begins with so if you look at the beginning of part one uh, is a matter of doubt even among the learned what the works of the law mean which I thought boy that's that's really interesting and then I I continued reading and he says you know some uh, and I think he there he says uh, Origen, Chrysostom, and Jerome go and take these as Jewish ceremonies, and they, they limit to this. And he kind of explains why. And he says, "Well, here's why they're wrong." I thought, well, that's really interesting. He goes and he cites these church fathers, so these you know the wisdom of the centuries, sort of against his own position, saying, "Here, this is why it's wrong." So I kept reading the section. I think, boy, that's interesting. What what Origen and Chrysostom are saying? It sounds like what N.T. Wright is saying. Right. That's odd. And then I so like so I kept I kept kept going on, and then he goes and says, you know, I'm not unaware that um, that Augustine has a different position from what I'm saying, uh, and he goes and he proceeds to say why Saint Augustine's position is wrong, and then he just kind of keeps going. I just thought this is really strange, right? Because I'd never come across a place in Calvin before where he um, was willing to go out on a limb in the same kind of way. There's, there's, I, there's one sort of analogous space in, in the institutes, um, in, in book, book two, where he's talking about free will that it reminded me of a little bit, but it, it was nothing like this. It wasn't as, as striking as this. Something, this is really strange. I wonder if you looked at the early reception of, of Paul, if you looked in these, these early church files, if you looked at the, you know, the sort of, again, you know, to use Piper's phrase, you look at the, you know, the wisdom of the centuries. Yeah. I wonder 
what they would say on this question and how it would line up with what we're calling the old and new perspective. Because it seems like what he's rejecting sounds in some way like, you know, what I've gotten used to reading from figures like, like Dan and Ryan. So, you know, that's how Hubble thing got, got started. You know, <clears throat> you and I have um, some similarities there because when I was Protestant and I was reading through Calvin and, of course, studying about the magisterial magisterial reformers, um, I was you saying them quoting the church fathers. So um, I started diving into the church fathers and I just was not seeing um, the Protestant perspective on the justification in the mm. church fathers. And I'm just thinking if this was really what sparked the Reformation, um, why am I not seeing it there in the perennial teachings of the, uh, the church fathers? And I, I even got Thomas Oden's book, A Justification Reader, and I just remained unconvinced after reading it. Right. I, I just, right. I'm still not seeing the extra nose imputation, you know, of, of Luther. I'm, I'm, I'm just not seeing it. Yeah. And everything that he's throwing out at you. <laughs> I, I've, I've come across that book as well. I haven't, I haven't read, read through it in entirety. Um, the, <laughs> The, the pieces that I, I did read had a similar kind of impression where yeah. uh, there was kind of the generalities that were that were sort of thrown out, but I don't really think that he did justice to the, uh, at least from my view, he didn't do justice either to the, the specificity of what, you know, Luther exactly is saying on justification, what Calvin is saying exactly, what, you know, the Council of Trent is, is saying exactly on, on, on justification. And, and they're really fine distinctions between them because, I mean, for for whatever differences there are, I mean, there there's a lot of shared ground between you know Trent and Calvin and Luther, and so you've really got to go. I mean, I, I remember the first time that I, I read the Council of Trent on Justification, just thinking, boy, this sounds way more reformed than I'm mm -hmm. than I'm used to. Uh, yeah. it, it just and that was that was that was from the context that I was, that I was coming from. That was just the, the impression that I had, and so. I, I think that um, if you just if you just say, "Oh, they're talking about you know the church fathers are talking about justification," so I mean it must have you know meant they were Calvinists or whatever. I think there is a um, it, it, it doesn't it just doesn't doesn't quite quite work, and I think that um, it, it, it's it, it's hard it's it's hard to go and to I think to to understand the you know the nuances. Of of Luther's theology, what and what really goes and makes it unique, and Calvin's theology, what makes it unique, and 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 you know the sort of the Tridentine formulas and everything you know like like that. I mean, they're really they're really fine fine distinctions, and right. you know if you're trying right. to do to do multiple multiple things. I mean, this is something I learned in doing you know, doing this dissertation. Uh, you know, I'm looking at um, you know I'm looking at Paul, and then I'm looking and you know and the early church fathers. Uh, and then I'm looking in the, the 16th century debates, and then I'm looking at the sort of the modern Pauline scholarship as well. And it's, um, you know, if you don't, <laughs> if you don't have, you know, three years, you know, kind of funded to go and to look at all of these, it's, it's, it's really, really difficult. It's really, it's not the kind of thing that you can, you know, you can sort of kind of patch together on a weekend. Well, you, so, you did the work for us. So all we um, need to do is just read your book. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, let me ask you another question here, and then I want to pass it to my brothers so they uh, they can jump in, um, and then maybe when they're done, I might might ask a few depending on how we're doing with time. Let me ask you this: um, You talk about Irenaeus in your book, and you mentioned that he's you know one of the last, in fact, the last witness of the living memory of the apostles. You know, so to me, he's going to be extremely important um, because he's one of the last ones who knew an apostle. <clears throat> at least as I understand it. Um, now, can you tell us what exactly was his view on the works of the law? And did he condemn all forms of works? Good question. Good question. So uh, I think, I mean, I think you're right that, you know, Irenaeus is, is really, you know, important for this. Uh, I just also think, I mean, Irenaeus is such a blast to read on this, on this material. He's so, He's so good, and so kind of whatever you know, whatever your, your perspective is on, uh, you know, whether you're an old perspective person or a new perspective person, whether you don't have any particular perspective, I think uh, it, it, as much as I can, I try to give a plug for reading the primary sources themselves, because I think you know the I think for for any anybody, the best thing that the best thing that I that I can be is, is a conduit to the to the primary sources them, themselves, and so I've. 
I've tried to go into summarize that material as best as I can, but I think that going back and reading the sources and really, you know, that really diving into their thought and kind of seeping in the logic of what's what's happening. Uh, that is, I think it's the best thing to do. And it's also the most edifying thing to do as well, because, uh, you know, for, for me, um, I mean, my, my, my debt to Irenaeus, is, uh, I don't, I don't really have adjectives to, to describe it. Uh, and, you know, for me, I just thought I was, you know, trying to write a, write a PhD and I, I really find, I found engaging with Irenaeus is to be a life-changing experience. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're interested in this particular, uh, um, you know, topic with Irenaeus, uh, you know, have a look through particularly book four of, of Against Heresies. Uh, you, you find it you know, relevant materially on books as well, but book four in particular. Uh, it's starting, I think it's starting around maybe uh, maybe chapter 12 I and mean, then going on from there. It's, it's really, really incredible on this. Um, Irenaeus, when he's talking about, you know, his, his understanding of, of, of works of the law, he understands it as, you know, the referent here is, uh, you know, the law, if you want to use the language from, from Galatians, um, you know, the law that Moses gives 430 years after the uh, the promises are made, made to Abraham. So the law that Moses goes and gives in the desert following the Exodus, when you have uh, the hard-hearted nation, you know, kind of having come down from Sinai, uh, you know, with, with, with the tablets and everything that kind of goes wrong there, uh, you have the, the nation of Israel in their hard-hearted and, and sinful condition. And so from Irenaeus' standpoint, what is given to them and what Paul is referring to by words of the law is, is sort of the, the, the long bat, the batch of legislation that goes and, you know, constitutes the you know, last bit of Exodus and, you know, kind of going, going on from there for the rest, the rest of the Pentateuch. But fundamentally, what's, you know, what's delivered in the desert to this hard hearted nation and uh, which is similar to what you're going to find in Justin, similar to what you're going to find in the rest, you know, these, 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 these sources. And so, uh, again, the, to just use the, the temporal, temporal indicator that you find in Galatians, this law that, that is delivered through Moses, you know, 400 years, 430 years, years after. And, you know, for him, the, the works in question, they are, uh, these, these same kinds of ones. So, you know, circumcision, Sabbath, you know, food laws, et cetera. And it's interesting if you look in his, in his uh, you know, in, 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 his, in his in his work, he's 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 careful to go and say, you know, for so for instance, you know, sacrifices and oblations. He doesn't go and say there's a problem with these things, sort of like qua sacrifices or qua oblations. The problem isn't that there's a sacrifice or, or an oblation, uh, because he says, you know, the new covenant has sacrifices and oblations as well. Um, the issue is that these pertain to the old covenant. They pertain to specifically the nation of Israel, and they pertain particularly to this hard-hearted condition that Israel found itself in, which the rest of humanity found itself in, too. And so this is the, uh, you know, if you look at the significance of, of these, you know, what, is it, what does it mean to practice these, the works of the law? He's just, he's just straightforward in that. This, this is to be part of the Jewish nation. So, it, you know, this, these things are given so that the race of Abraham might continue recognizable, uh, specifically with circumcision, to use, use that, that example. Um, and then when he's saying, you know, okay, well, what's the problem with these things? You know, why, 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 why are they they're rejected? Uh, he, his, I mean, his his reasoning on this is 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 just beautiful. There's so much good stuff that's here, uh, and he talks about how it is that in Christ God has now renewed all of humanity, and so whereas previously, you know, Israel and particularly but all of humanity in general had, you know, this sort of heart of stone uh, to use the Old Testament language. Uh, in Christ, humanity has now been given this heart of flesh. You have now, uh, you've had, you know, if you take Deuteronomy's 30s, you know, the promised circumcision of the heart. Uh, this has now come to pass in the new covenant by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so because of that, the, the law that was given to hard-hearted Israel in the desert on account, you know, of its, of its sinfulness, uh, that doesn't, it doesn't pertain to those who have now been given a new heart, who have, you know, uh, had experienced this heart, heart circumcision, uh, and who have been renewed by the Holy Spirit. And what you have now instead is you, you have the, you know, the teachings and, and ordinances of Christ, which are, you know, the law that pertains to the new covenant. And this law that pertains to the new covenant goes, and it, it takes the place of you know the same way that you have you know the mosaic the mosaic law pertaining to that covenant. So too now within Christ's new covenant, you have you know what he's taught, what he's ordained that goes and constitutes the new law that uh, the, the new legislation that that Christ now now live under, um, which 
you know, both refers to the, the actual material that's there, but then also also the power that's associated with it, also the, the, the Holy Spirit's re renewing power that goes and revivifies man. And so it's interesting the way he goes, and he's got, he's got a really interesting uh, uh, language he uses that describes you know, the law that gives, that gives life. Um, uh, is, is, you know, one of the ones that's there. And he goes and he ties that in with the prophecies, prophecies that you find in, uh, you know, Micah 4. Uh, yeah, Micah 4, you know, the law that is going to come forth from Zion. And so, uh, so Micah 4, Isaiah 2, and then later on, in, I think it was Isaiah 41, 42, around there. But the, the, the promises that are, that are made, of this, this law will come forth from Jerusalem to go and to transform the nations. He just kind of looks around us and says, well, guys, I guess this is it. <laughs> this is what's going to happen because, you know, he arriving from, you know, from Leon and somebody from Smyrna uh, can look around and say, well, this is what is happening. Uh, you know, everybody is, is, is being transformed the way that, uh, you know, that Micah and, uh, you know, Isaiah fo foresaw. So anyway, that's a, a little bit of, of Irenaeus so, on works of the law. So it, it wasn't the case that Irenaeus just saw all works as... Um, bad and any kind of work you're just into works righteousness it was more uh the sense that what paul is condemning when he when it comes to works of the law is basically jewish boundary markers jewish works of the law as opposed to christian works which uh do play a role in our salvation is that accurate that that is accurate now Irenaeus actually has an, an interesting line uh you know when he's talking because he does he does go and divide the works of the decalogue so it's a, mm -hmm. so the ten commandments mm -hmm. from this subsequent legislation that goes and comes comes afterwards and so it's clear for him that the the moral precepts of the law are closely linked with justification by, by faith if you if you look in chapter 11 of the book i kind of deep yeah, I, I go i go through those those passages where he talks about that, but he, he, you know, he goes and says, you know, this isn't, this isn't the target. This isn't sort of what's, what's abrogated within the new covenant. And, uh, you know, if anybody does not observe these things, they have no salvation. Uh, yeah. and then he goes and he says that, you know, these are what you have in the 10 commandment. These were the same, these kind of eternal righteous precepts. And these were the things that the righteous patriarchs themselves all also observe. And so the 10 commandments, it's not so giving you any, any new material. This is this is sort of what constitutes human human righteousness. And so, when he looks at, he talks about those who were who were justified you know, by faith, who anti who antedated the law. He says that they this is this is what they did. They had you know they kind of had the, the heart the, the these these laws written on their heart, and then when they acted in accordance with them, and that's what passed away in in Egypt. That's what was sort of lost within the you know the the Israelites long long captivity there, and that is sort of that that writing of the the righteousness of the law on our hearts is now what's what's been restored uh to us in in christ so and and speaking of this i mean a, a note in your book where um you you talk about irenaeus and you mention his understanding of the decalogue he says about the decalogue it is the entrance into life which if anyone does not observe has no salvation yeah um, I don't yeah. know any uh, person who, <laughs> who you know, believes in the magisterial reformers who, who would really take that position. So I, I'd imagine people yeah. would be a little uncomfortable with Irenaeus there. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's it's interesting. I think it is. Um, I mean, I can say in my my own experience, I've um, most Lutheran contexts that I've I've had I've you know had experiencing would would be uncomfortable with that language. I would say with the the you know the reformed uh, yeah the reformed context that I'm, you know I'm part of uh, it there's you know there, there's there's a spectrum there and there's definitely reformed folks who I know who really think there there is a real justification by works within within reformed thought and that and that you know kind of you know later uh, parts of the reformed tradition just don't just don't take that seriously enough and so. Uh, you know, there's, there's people who who's who thought I don't go and respect who are parts of the you know reform tradition who would look at your what your name says there and still still want to claim it in some some sense as like yeah I think I think that that, that is correct. Uh, there's definitely other folks who would look at that and be like yeah, we're, yeah. that's wrong. <laughs> so, and <laughs> and, um, and 
by the way, I think I misspoke. I think I said that Irenaeus knew John. I, I believe it was the case. He knew Polycarp who knew John. He, he, knew, he, knew, he knew Polycarp. It's funny because yeah. I uh, this is this is a probably a bad analogy, but um, I, I've been thinking I've been thinking about this. I think partially because I, I have such a debt to Irenaeus, and then uh, it, my I have an even bigger you know debt in my own life to, to C.S. Lewis as well, and so. I, I, I keep thinking about this because um, uh, Walter Cooper pa just passed away. Who's a, a, we, we got to know when, when we were in Oxford, and I always think of um, you know how Cooper he you know he he knew Lewis just for this this bit, but everything that he knew about you know, Lewis and all of his experience was just kind of burned to him, into his his you know his right. his 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 memory. And then he when he passed all of this on to those who you know who became his friends as well. And so I I always just end up thinking about the way that you have. You know saint saint john and polycarp and then you know irenaeus i just always think of that in terms of uh you know lewis who again, yeah for, for for me my my, my debt my debt to him is is uh is, is incalculable uh you know for, from lewis to, to hooper and then i mean i'm not really gonna say hey i'm i'm on i have the stature of irenaeus but i'm just some guy like like irenaeus the same kind of thing who has um it, it's interesting for the methodology of the book, book as well who, who has received um, you know, this kind of living memory. So there's, yeah. you know, I've, I've, you know, had a chance to, you know, to, to go to Lewis's, you know, Lewis's house a bunch of times, I had a chance to, you know, to, to learn a lot anecdotally about the kinds of things that he did in the places that, that he went. And so I think as far as an, an illustration of the way that, you know, Lewis was alive and operating, uh, you know, I guess if you want to say his, his main, main literary career, probably started about, you know, 80 years ago, somewhere, somewhere around there. And then for the next four years on that, just the way that these kinds of memories can pass on from generation to, to generation through these kinds of personal links. I think it's an interesting sort of analogy for the methodologically some of the stuff that you have in the beginning of this book with, with you know, some of Marcus Bachmann's uh, stuff on living memory and stuff like that. So, so uh, much to say there, especially on apostolic succession. But um, and I have a million other questions, but I've hogged way too much of your time and not given any time to William and Eric. I apologize, brothers. <laughs> Don't be mad. <laughs> oh, that's fine. I'm enjoying this. No, you all those. have been great. Uh, no, let me good. pass it to you, William. What you got? No, no, it's been great. You have not uh, you've not hogged anything. I've really been enjoying absorbing the whole conversation. Really, uh, Dr. Matthew, great. Thank you very much for coming on. And Michael, a very engaging conversation. Um, <clears throat> kind of piggybacking off a little bit of the discussion y'all were having. I am I am particularly fascinated by Romans 328, where we read um um the very famous passage of Luther, the very famous passage from Luther, where he added the word alone. Uh, and I, I know you've done your homework here. I, I really wonder what your thoughts are on that, because um, I, I, I've done. It's a, it's a great idea. We should delete and add words all the time. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's go, go for it. You have, you have my blessing. There you go. And his kind of his response of, uh, you know, it, it came across to me. And it should come across to anybody, in my opinion, that it was quite arrogant uh, when he uh, when he anticipated that he would be pressed upon adding that word. Uh, he believed that it was uh, that he was justified, pun intended, in, in adding that word. But in in the research you have done, this is one of the questions I'd like to ask you: Were you able to find any any early father or any medieval father that had added that word alone prior to Luther? Boy, that's a great, a great question. So I think that what is, um, so I, the best, the best way I think that you can, you can actually engage this is by looking at Luther himself, yeah. um, and looking at what, what Luther goes and, and says about, about the church fathers. Now, if you want to say, can you find the phrase, you know, faith, faith alone within the church fathers, boy, yeah, you can find, you can find all kinds of stuff. Uh, sure. and, and there, and there's a sense in which, a, a phrase like that isn't isn't problematic. I think if you're saying, uh, I agree. For, you know, for, from from a later standpoint, it's, it all comes down to, hey, what do you what do you go and mean mean by that? Um, I think that if you're looking within within Luther's uh, within Luther's writings, when he goes and says says about the fathers, um, I think that Luther's pretty forthright that he doesn't see anybody, uh, even if you have any kind of lexical overlap. He doesn't see any of the church fathers or any of the any of the medievals for that matter um, who go and mean 
by faith alone, what he takes that to mean in relation to, to works and justification and how all of that goes and fits together. And I, and I think that that's a, you know, I think it's a big piece of why he has, you know, as, as he much negative to say about, about the fathers and the medieval tradition as he, as he, as he does. And so uh, if you, um, you know, if, if you, if you look at uh, it's some, you know, some of the stuff, there's, there's just statements that are there. Uh, where you're like, this is like, I, I, it's like kind of unthinkable. There's, 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 there's one where he goes and he says, uh, what is it? That he says, uh, yeah, what is it? The, the, the Jews and the Turks knew the gospels be- that gospel better than the fathers. Yeah. I think, you know, wow. That is, um, that is not what, but from reading John Piper, that was not what I thought Luther was trying to do in linking up his writings with the church fathers. <laughs> there is a, uh, and, and that's, I mean, that's, you know, that's not like a sort of a one isolated example. And, and for me, I mean, I have, I have this, you know, in the, um, you know, at the, at the end of the book as well, I'm talking about Luther in, in relation to, to Augustine. Um, you know, he, Augustine is often singled out as kind of the one guy who goes, goes and goes and gets it. But it's really interesting. I think that, um, Alistair McGrath in his, in his, his, his new version of his Day, which he does, he does this well in the earlier editions as well. He's really good at showing how Luther's understanding of justification is not a retrieval of Augustine, um, because it, it, because you know McGrath goes and you know makes clear that what the Council of Trent goes and does is, is just a restatement of Augustine's understanding of justification. It just kind of goes and says says, says says the same thing there. What 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 Alistair I think is really good at, at doing is showing that rather than ending with Augustine. Uh, it Luther precisely begins with Augustine. That's that's his starting point. I mean, the guy's an he's an Augustinian monk for crying out loud. Um, and so that's that's his his starting point. And it's and I think it's it's you know through through you know over, over time, just being becoming convinced that Augustine didn't have all of this right. That there was stuff that he was he was incorrect on. Um, that I think is where you get the you know the, the unique Lutheran interpretation of justification. So you I have the note in there where you know he uh, you know Luther goes and kind of talks about like hey Augustine was the only one in the early church, church who who sort of got things right, but even he doesn't doesn't quite get yep. it. And there's the other bit from his, his table talk where he, he says, and it, which I think is actually really good for understanding this this narrative in, in Luther's life, where he says you know. At first, uh, I not merely read, but devoured the works of Augustine. But as soon as the door was opened for me, so that I understood, and Paul with justification by faith meant it was all over with Augustine. Um, yeah, that think, does say a lot. I think, yeah, and I think I think that's I think that's accurate, and I think that other folks like um, you know like like McGrath do a good job of showing showing that in detail the way that that works, and then it's carried on, in, you know, in, in Melanchthon, for instance. So there is the I mean, there's the there's the, the famous what is it? Uh, so 1541, I think it's the famous uh, letter from Melanchthon to Brenz, where Brenz is sending him, uh, he sends, sends his letter saying like, hey, is what you're saying, is this kind of like what Augustine is saying? And Melanchthon goes and says, no, it's not. Don't, you need to stop reading Augustine. I only go and appeal to this guy because of what the masses think about him. He does not exhaust the theology of St. Paul. He doesn't He doesn't quite understand him. Um, and uh, there's a... Um, uh, yeah, there's there's some there's some really interesting articles that are that are written on that correspondence between uh, between Brenz and and, um, and and Melanchthon, which I think if I remember correctly, I think uh, Luther goes and appends something on that particular correspondence, and Melanchthon just says, "Hey, Brenz, stop reading Augustine." <laughs> <laughs> if I remember correctly, that's, that's kind of the um, that's sort of the, the sum, summary of it. So, um, I, I, a project like this, I think, to 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 do justice. To this, you know, all the various sources here. It's like, as, as I was saying, you you have to um, you, you you have to get into detail in a lot of these different areas. Yep. Which, I mean, I'm, I'll be the first to confess, it's not easy to do, and, I, and it's not. I mean, I don't have every in and out of all this stuff mastered, you know, by by any means. But I, I, I will I will say that from my standpoint, the more that you get into, you know, really reading primary source Luther primary source Calvin and in a way it's similar to reading you know primary source uh you know Irenaeus as well this stuff is just really fun it's really really interesting and I think it's yeah. because the the historical realities are, are are so much more interesting than the caricatures that you know I uh, you know I, I think that step on, on Melanchthon and Brands I first came across like two o'clock in the morning 
at some point, just because I was up reading these, you know, this primary source material, I just found it so, so interesting. So, um, it, I, again, as, as, as much as I, uh, um, as I try to advertise, you know, go and read, you know, the primary source patristic stuff, I think that reading primary source, you know, Luther, primary source Calvin is, is really good. And particularly, um, I should say this, if you're going to read primary source L Luther, uh, make sure you get the full edition of the lectures on Galatians because it's such an important work and almost everybody who knows it in English knows it from the very, very abrogated version which is out and that not the sort of full one from the Luther's works thing. And they're so different. Uh, it, the abrogated one neuters Luther's thoughts so, so thoroughly. And we actually have a chance to go, go through the, the, the full one that's there. I mean, it's, there's times you're reading, it's like, this is crazy. But there's also times you're reading, like, hey, there's something that's profound here. I don't know if I would agree with it, probably, but it's just so, it's so, so much more interesting. And so it's, it's one that's in Luther's works. It's not as easily accessible. You might need to figure out, you know, to get Luther's work in accordance or a log graph, so kind of whatever you do. But make sure when you're going through those sources, go, go through the real ones. Don't, 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 don't do an don't abrogated thing because you want the, you want the, you want the real stuff. That, that is a really good point you bring up, and I agree with you completely that we've got to go to uh, the very first-hand source material. I mean, you've got to do that. I think when we do it, um, I, I really have got to be honest with you, I think we get a different portrait of Luther than a lot of the stuff that is floating out there, uh, uh, not only within Catholicism, but even within Protestantism. Um, uh, you frequently, in my opinion, have a kind of a reimagining of Luther that doesn't line up with uh, when you read his actual works. For instance, um, there are a lot of, uh, you know, Protestant authors from the 1800s and on uh, carrying over to modern, the modern day era where they've tried to, tried to more or less answer away the addition of, uh, of that German word alone that Luther added by kind of trying to say that there were, um, that there were fathers beforehand that had done that. When even Luther doesn't argue that they had done that to Romans 3, he recognizes what he did was a novelty. What he did argue, as you said, was he did argue that some fathers taught the theology itself of sola fide, which, of course, I, I completely disagree with. But what I even find quite fascinating is people have, uh, Protestants have gone as far as to saying that there were German editions prior to Luther that had that word alone, and there were none. I've looked at them. Mm -hmm. uh, the earlier one that Luther relied heavily on, the Coburger Bible, uh, it didn't have that word alone either. So Luther was clearly, he knew what he was doing. And the argument that the German language grammatically warranted that, uh, it, it didn't warrant it. If it would have warranted it, previous editions would have had that, uh, that edition. But I wonder, because because I, I can, by the way, I can't wait to get a hold of your book. I will be getting a hold of it soon. I wonder, how, do, do you... Do you go into the later fathers, such as um, Ambrose, Ambrosiaster, or any others? Do you, do you ever examine those? And if you don't in your book, have you done that personally? Have you looked at the way they they interpret in particular works of the law? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I, I, you know, the the scope of the book goes up to up to Irenaeus, and uh, you know, the reason it does that, besides that, I only have so many pieces of paper. That I can go and write words on um, is that I'm trying to go into look within the the, the period of living memory. So uh, it, it's the language of I'm, I'm used from from Marcus Bachmill, where it's you know generally speaking about 150 years after you know the person events in, in, in question. When you know what I guess you could say interpretation isn't strictly informed by by text, but it's informed also by by memory and those memories passed on uh within sort of this succeeding couple of generations so the same way that you know i guess you could say when i'm when i'm 80 80 years old i will still possess memories of being in c.s lewis's house of hearing about you know the things that lewis did and said and all all those kinds of things from you know from from walter hooper from, you know, personally so it's that that kind of kind of idea so, so that's why i'm looking at this the, the, the earlier period you know i think a, a couple of things with what, what you're saying, saying, saying with Luther. I think if from from Luther's standpoint, and I, I don't know, I, don't know. <laughs> I guess I'm not, I'm not like super interested in just like kind of, kind of trying to, you know, to, to beat up on Luther or whatever, but I think that in justification, if Luther thinks 
that any of the fathers have things right on justification, it would be very easy for him to just go and say, guys, just listen to Ambrose on this. Yep. Just listen to Chris Austin on this. Like if you guys, or hey, if we can, can you know, St. Augustine, let's just, if we, if we just go with St. Augustine on this, He's gonna he's gonna lead us in the you know in the, in the right sort of right the right the right path, um, and it's and, and I mean you can go go through his works that that's just absent in his, in, 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 instead what you find uh, you know is, is 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 you know it's quite the opposite where he goes and uh, you know at the beginning of his, of his Romans commentary for example he goes and says uh, you know he kind of gives his definition from all all the terms and he says you know if anyone goes and defines you know, defines these words differently, so it gives you a different understanding. Uh, don't don't listen to them, no matter who they are. So whether it's, I believe he has Ambrose on that list, if I remember correctly. So whether it's yep. you know, I, you know, Augustine, Ambrose, Jerome, Chrysostom, or even you know, ones who are, who are greater greater than they. If you don't understand these words in in this way, so in the way that he's defining these terms, you will not understand any letter of Saint Paul or anything else in the rest of the scriptures either. And so there is a. Um, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, that's kind of the opposite of that, of that of that posture of going and saying, "Hey, you know, this is this this particular father, uh, whoever will go and go and get get it right." And and it's certainly, I think, if he uh, if his own understanding was that there was one of the fathers who had really gotten things right, who had who had understood things, um, you know, on on justification, you know, correctly, it you know would be very easy for him to go and to make make that appeal and, and instead what you you know what you get uh the, the best resource i can get for this there's a uh there's there's a uh, a, a chapter on this and a, uh, a a book which is somewhat obscure on uh, on the on sort of the the reception of the church fathers and this is in uh in, in sort of reformation period and so it's a it's a, a chapter by uh manfred schultz uh who it's i, I believe it's called uh, martin luther and the church fathers but it's it's uh it's my record. hundred pages. You have that book. What's that? You have that book. Yeah. So I, uh, I, I have, I have the the chapter uh, for for because I, I I use it in in the dissertation when I was going 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 through. Uh, it's 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 a fascinating article because uh, Schultz. Who I I don't know his his background a whole lot. I'm guessing he's sort of a liberal Protestant, but he kind of goes and he uh, he 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 looks at all of Luther's statements you know, on, on the fathers. And he just basically says, you know, what the, his conclusion is, uh, uh, Martin Luther went and established it. The, the point that finally, uh, the, the fathers had the freedom to be wrong. And, and the, uh, and, and you know, later interpreters had, had the, the freedom to go and to say the, the fathers were wrong. Um, and he goes and he gives kind of copious examples of, you know, Luther going and saying, no, the, you know, the fathers, not just sort of like, you know, one or two, but the, the fathers writ large had, had this, had this wrong. Uh, and so if he has, uh, you know, if you're, if you're, uh, I think it's, you know, it's a particularly valuable source for that. I believe, I believe it's, it's, I believe that Schultz is, you know, is, is, is a Lutheran as well. So I think he's, you know, he writes as a, as a sympathetic reader who just thinks, as far as I know, he thinks that Luther has things right, and, and you know the the, the fathers, uh, you know, have 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 stuff wrong. So the uh, with 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 that particular question, um, like, I, like I like I said, I think if uh, if Luther wanted to go and to to say, hey, let's just you know let's all kind of hold hands and read Ambrose, and we're, we're going to figure figure this out, uh, that would be easy to do. And I think that the, the same the same can be. Can, you know, can be said for, for for Calvin as well. I think on this, um, I think similarly with you know with, with what I was saying with my experience of, with Romans three twenty, uh, you know he doesn't go and identify you know any anybody who in, in his view gets gets this right. And so there is you know, with you know uh, McGrath has the language um, in his, his famous you know nineteen eighty two article on justification where he talks about how the Reformation understanding of justification is, you know, there's, there's a theological novum that's there. It's a real new yeah. thing. Um, and I think, I think that, that McGrath is correct there. I think that he's, I think he's accurate. And I think that that's actually confirmed by the reformers themselves. If you look at, you know, if you really look in detail about the kinds of things that they're saying about the figures uh, that precede them in this, 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 this area, I think that, 
uh, you know, this, it's not as though they're saying, you know, it's not, it's not as I, I guess you could say, it's not the Luther saying, like, look, I'm just trying to just be a faithful, you know, Augustinian or a faithful like you know, Ambrosian or, or whatever. And you guys are mis misinterpreting me. Uh, it, again, it's, it's, it's the opposite posture. It's like, no matter, no matter what these guys say, do not understand them in a way that's different from what I'm, what I'm telling you. Otherwise you're going to, you're, you're going to be, be lost with, with the, the sec second part of that, the, um, the the question of uh the, you know the open letter on, on translating so what is the the, the faith alone material again that that's that source is um is is available on online open source so if anybody is is, is interested in it, it's a it's a really fascinating document and it, i i think just to get into um I, you know I've, I've described it before in this way um i i kind of uh I've, i thought to myself if i ever taught a, a course on modern protestant thought I might go and begin with that open letter on translating um, because it's really interesting how there is, it's, I, I don't, I don't, I don't even know the best words to describe it. There's almost a kind of relativism that's there in, in, in the way that Luther goes and approaches because he goes and he defends his translation says, Hey, this is why I have a line here. This is why, that's why, you know, I, I, I translate in this way and he goes and he kind of makes fun of his opponents and calls them donkeys and stuff like that, which is kind of what you're used to. Yep. But it's really interesting because he goes and he says, you know, and if, and if you don't like my translation, that's fine. You go make your own translation. Like, what do I care? It doesn't matter to me. You can go, you can go and translate. You can, everyone can have their own translation. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to me, but I get to have my translation and I'm going to translate this as I see fit, as I think that Paul's, you know, Paul's, you know, material works. And if you think that every translation is an interpretation, we, when he's saying translation, we really yeah. mean not just like word for word, but we mean an interpretation. The way that you know Luther says, yeah, you you have your interpretation. This is fine. You can have as many as many interpretations as you want, but I'm gonna have my interpretation. I almost kind of feel like, boy, like I, I sort of feel like I'm like um uh, like just sort of the, the 21st century postmodern condition is all like the seeds that are all all, all present here, and maybe it's more than just sort of seed form, maybe this is already kind of, you know, grown, grown up. So uh, it's, it's a fascinating, you know, writing. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't know, I, I commend it for, for, for general readership for all, all, all kinds of reasons. I think it's really interesting. Uh, on that note, I had one more question, then I want to pass it over to my brother, Eric. But on that very same note, I, I find it fascinating. The, um, and I'm reading the word, I'm reminded of the words of, um, of St. Robert Bellarmine, who Commenting on Luther, he said that Luther was so audacious as to transform himself from a translator into an interpreter of God's word by adding that word to Romans three. So I think that that really um, that really does say a lot as to how the climate was at that time when when um, adept and when uh, intellectual uh, Catholic reformers, if you will, were not very happy with. Uh, with Luther's edition there. But um, one other thing that I'm very fascinated at. Can I just toss, toss one thing in there real quick? Yeah, definitely. I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Really. It's just, no, no, it's no, no, not at all. No you, you, can, you can find the phrase faith alone in Aquinas' writings as well. If right. I remember correctly, I think that, you know, reading through Aquinas on, on, on Galatians. Yeah. You can, you can go find there's, And there's a couple times in, in reading, um, there's a couple times in reading Aquinas on, on Galatians where I just thought to myself, I wish that Luther had, had actually read through Aquinas and stuff because it doesn't seem as though he had a whole lot of you know familiarity, uh, you know, with Aquinas. He doesn't he doesn't like Aquinas, but he also doesn't seem to have have read a great great deal of them. And there's a number of again, if you're thinking, you know, the proximity of the Tridentine formulations, uh, which I mean, I'm not I'm I'm not a huge huge expert on so, but how close they are in, in a lot of ways. And if you're thinking, you know, Regensburg, for example, and how close you know the the Catholic and Reformed and you know Lutheran parties are all to having some some kind of agreement there, which eventually goes 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 and breaks down. Um, I think that, you know, you can see a lot of them are, are, are drawn on, uh, they're, they're drawn on Aquinas there. And there's, you know, I, I, for, for my part, I, I wish that, um, I wish that Luther had, you know, had gone and read, read stuff like that, because I think that there's, there's things that are there that you can say, you know, perhaps would have been satisfying for the way that he goes and, uh, tries to put the pieces together and then it doesn't, you know, it doesn't end up, end up working perfectly. And then you end up sort of having to dislodge James and Hebrews and other, other stuff to kind of make it, make it go, you know, to work. It's, there's a, there's a number of places where it's like, you, 
you wish he had been informed by that rather than just sort of, you know, re rejecting it whole, wholesale. But again, the issue there is, you know, when you use the, the phrase, you know, faith alone, you know, does, does he mean by it the same thing as what, you know, what, 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 what Luther does? And I think, you know, Luther probably knew enough of, of you know, Aquinas and, and sought to know that the answer, you know, the answer was no there as far as the understanding of how to fit into the broader theology of justification. So anyway, I'm sorry to inter interrupt you. I just no, no, no. Great, to, great point there. there. Great point. My, my final question for you was, um, when looking at um, the term, the term works of the law, did you ever, when you were looking to the fathers, did you ever find any that would have gone along the lines of, um, of seeing all good works, all good works absorbed into that very phrase? Did you ever find any father that did that? So it's just kind of like a, a good, a good works in general sort of thing. Right. Got gotcha. So I, I I talk about this. Um, so I, I, I would say if you if you're going to frame it in that way, sort of all good works in general. Yeah. The answer that yeah, I, would, no. I would say I would say to that is no. I think the if you if you look in the in the the preface of the new edition of the book and then at the end of the book, I have these these sections where I talk about the the Augustinian interpretation of works of the law because within the the context of the Pelagian controversy you do have a distinct interpretation that he gives of works of the law. And so if you look at, for instance, in his, in his earlier writings in, you know, Contra Faustum, he's still, he's still articulating what I, I call the early perspective, which is the, you know, what, what you find in your name is what you find in everybody else as far as seeing this in terms of, in terms of the Torah and, you know, obeying these particular works of the Torah so that you can identify with the Jews and become part of the Jewish nation and covenant and in, you know, the reasons for, for objecting to these. And so you find that throughout your con Contra Faustum in uh, what, 397, I believe. And then you have the, the Pelagian controversy after that. And so there you have the debate transposed from what is, at least in the Contra Faustum context, is still talking about sort of the Jew-Gentile debate. Now you're talking about a soteriological debate which is a sort of Christian versus Christian kind of thing. And now these texts are employed in a, in a different context from Very the, different. The, the Jew Gentile context. And so in that context, Augustine goes and interprets works of the law as any works that are done apart from God's grace. And then he goes and he contrasts that with works which are meritorious, which are empowered by God's grace. And so you, uh, so that, and so that's kind of what he goes and it does in relation to, to, to Pelagius. So it's not a, it's it's not a sort of contra good works all altogether kind of thing, but works that are done independently of God's grace, whatever they happen to be, in the context of the debate with Pelagius, those those aren't justifying. They're not they're not sociologically you know availing. Um, and then it, 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 the, the contrast with that is you know would be would be works of faith, works that are empowered by the Holy Spirit, which because Christ lives in you, what, you know, what Christ, what Christ does is meritorious. And so um, if Christ is working in you by the power of the Holy Spirit, then there is, there is actual merit there, which is kind of, I think the, the logic uh, in upon which it, uh, St. Augustine's theology of merit goes and works. What's interesting, it, I, I talk about this in the prefaces, uh, when sort of after the Pelagian controversy, so after this is, has, has, has played out, at the end of his, his life, and I believe in 328, uh, you have his uh, his treatise in answer to the Jews. And it's really interesting because when he comes back to that, that context, he's still talking about this in terms of circumcision, Sabbath, food laws, the things that are what he calls the, the ancient sacraments. And what he goes and he contrasts with you know, what he calls the, 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 you know, the new sacraments, so the sacraments of that, that pertain to the, to the new covenant. And so you still find even after it's not like as though there's some, some, like uh, some kind of like, you know, uh, con conversion, you know, from, 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 from St. Augustine, because he continues to go and to, to, uh, to, to use this interpretation, even after the Pelagian controversy, once he's you know, returned back to the, um, to, you know, the, the context of the sort of the Jew Gentile, uh, you know, debate. And you find throughout the medieval period, you find both of these, these readings preserved and, you know, because I guess you could say, from the standpoint of uh, you know the, the 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 early sort of perspective interpretation, uh, even though this is the, the matter in in debate is circumcision, Sabbath, food laws, those kinds of things, it's not as though the, the early fathers themselves are saying, but all these other works are sociologically you know availing. So those are all those are all great. Your salvation is going to come from, from you know from, from those things. 
that's they're not saying that either. And so the, because because the two because you said that, that sort of the, the early and Augustinian understandings because they're because they're compatible with one another it doesn't become a source the source of controversy. And so if you're looking again, you know, Aquinas and Galatians, other medieval interpreters, they they give you both both readings, both interpretations. There's not a there's not a, a, a sort of a problem with one or the other. Just kind of you know what what are you actually actually talking about here? So that is. Was that, was that, I'm sorry, was that the entirety of the question? Yeah, that, that was definitely everything. And I greatly, greatly appreciate your, your reply. I look very forward to getting a hold of your book. And I do want to pass it over to, to my brother, Eric, so you can pick your brain. Brother Eric, go for it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for coming on. Sorry for being a little late. No, um, that's totally, totally fine. If I, if I pass out at some point, I, I, I was telling the guys, I had, I had two hours of faculty meetings. I had two hours looking at the screen just before I got in here. And so oh, if I wow. lose consciousness, if you could go... And uh, alert the authorities. Dial nine one one. Just let, yeah. let me know. I'm like I'm like looking at my own eyes in the screen, and I can tell that they're starting to glaze over here. So yeah, no if, if I do pass out, it's not because I don't I don't enjoy this. I don't don't like you guys. It's <laughs> because my eyeballs have ceased to operate. Right. Well, you know, it, I I was listening to your story as as uh, at the first moment the video started and. Uh, you and I have a lot in common, and I want to affirm uh, the explanations that you're giving here about, you know, the the specific contextual meaning for ergo nomu works of the law, and then also this question that William brought up about how this doesn't mean that the early second century authors were saying that, well, we exclude the ancient Jewish sacraments. And we include all the moral good works as if they can avail through natural power for your salvation. So that was a very, very good um, uh, uh, qualification. Because going back to 2006, 2007, I was racked by this debate. I was mm -hmm. in the midst of that N.T. Wright versus uh, John Piper debate. Um, there was another one, a little spat between J James White and Mark Seyfried from uh, uh, American Seminary over here mm -hmm. over the same issue. And, uh, you know, I was really siding with John Piper at the time because I was a Protestant. And uh, it was difficult to really understand what N.T. Wright was saying because he kept saying that he's not denying anything essential from the Reformation, but he's trying to just put things in order. You know, hmm. and, and interpret Paul correctly, and uh, that's when I got into. I actually contacted Douglas Moo uh, hmm. because uh, he he uh, contributed to a, a two volume work that was edited by D. A. Carson, uh, Justification and Variegated Nomism, hmm. and that was tackling the new perspective on Paul back then. I think in two thousand seven, and uh, interestingly enough, um, when I Across the horizon, I went from being a Reformed Baptist, you know, to sitting down with Lutherans and going to Lutheran services, and then finally as a as a as an Anglo Catholic. Before I came back uh, into the Catholic Church, I I pretty much went over to the side uh, that I saw many new Protestants in scholarship basically articulating anyway. So. I was reading, I don't know if you've heard of Scott Hafeman, but uh, mm -hmm. he, he um, Richard Gaffin, a lot of these guys were not conceding to the new perspective, but they were in the backstage reforming Pauline expression, their, their expression of Pauline theology, mm -hmm. without wanting to say, hey, the new perspective got it right. Mm -hmm. um, they were they were reforming Pauline theology to incorporate instead of bruising the connection between faith and works, uh, bruising the vein that connects them. They started mm -hmm. articulating Pauline theology to try and make a an easier connection between faith and works. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this is what eventually led me to become a, a to to realize that the Catholic Church, the, the, the at the at the Council of Trent actually got it right hmm. and um that was a fascinating uh uh you know so I, I concur with a lot of the things that you're finding there you know a lot of i i think that at first and here's here's my question for you because at first when i was reading you know sanders and james dunn 
I almost felt like they weren't really doing enough justice that guys like Stephen Westerholm were pointing out in Paul that Paul is not just interested in convincing his readers of excluding Jewish sacraments. He's also trying to indict the human race of a moral failure. Yeah. And, and um, so it's almost as if that moral failure is a deeper foundation from which he's talking about in order to erect the need for the new human being, the new creation. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so the, the exclusion of the work, the Jewish works of the law, so it does have, and correct me if I'm wrong, it does have an implication of excluding moral works in light of the moral failure that came in through Adam and sin, um, but that the work, those Jewish sacraments were not empowered to make the new human being. Yeah, it's it's the gospel that makes the new human being. Yeah, but once once you are that under grace, um, now good works in that new creation are no longer the kind of works that merit and constrain God to give you uh, salvation anymore. This is a whole new context where it's gracious from beginning to the middle to the means all the way to the end. Yeah. yeah. It, it, so, so would you agree that Paul, while, while when he when he brings the phrase ergo, ergo nomu, he, he has a very peculiar meaning, but would you also agree that he would also say that old the old Adamic humanity cannot empower itself through the through more even moral even moral yeah. law um in, in in order to liberate itself from the slavery to sin you yeah know? no so i will i'm only going to disagree with the smallest point there the smallest point is i don't think it has a particularly peculiar meaning because if you're looking and this is this you know for me as far as the you know the inspiration for, for the, the the project itself if you're looking in the context of of Romans and Galatians, he, Paul doesn't define works of the law either time. He seems to he seems to just think everybody knows what I'm what I'm talking about here within you know his, his audiences, and you know that goes in that goes in Galatians for a church that he's, he's established. Rome, he's never he's never he's never been to that church before. He doesn't know, he doesn't know know you know the, the, the people the people there. And he can still just toss works of the law in there and assume that it's going to be understood by everybody, which is why for me thinking, gosh, boy, if this is, um, you know, to, uh, to to employ an analogy, if you're trying, if you're looking at the fork and thinking, is this a fork or is this a dingle hopper, uh, as, as Scuttle says in, in The Little Mermaid, and you've got a whole bunch of people say, hey, this is a fork, you know, and you got, you know, Scuttle and all his friends that live out in the sea and say, hey, you know, that, no, it's actually a dingle hopper. You go and you comb your hair with it. It's like, boy, this is one way. Why don't you just go back to the original context and sort of look all around there and see, you know, are, are people going and combing their hair with these things or are they eating food with them? Because it seems like it's it doesn't seem to be mysterious in Paul's own, own, own context. Having, having said that, I agree with everything that you're saying. And I, and I think particularly, um, you know, I've, I've tried as much as I can in this book to go and to not be like, hey, this is, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, sort of, hey, I have a big defense of the new perspective, or as a takedown of the old perspective. You know, like I've, I've tried to go in to present, you know, the material as fairly as I can, and to present, uh, you know, the early reception in relation to that as, as best I can. And I, and I do think that you're right that there is, uh, if you're looking in, in, you know, figures like Sanders and Dunn, it does seem like, and this this goes for some other, uh, you know, uh, new perspective folks. It, it seems it seems at least at times as though. Uh, Everything is just made about the Jew-Gentile conflict, and just, just, just you can say the universal argument that no, this just makes you this limits the promises to uh, to just the nation of, of Israel. They're always meant to be universal. Uh, therefore, you know you need to go and get rid of these bound you know, these, these these boundaries. Well, that's that's true. That's abs that's absolutely correct. But there's another level to that, and, and I think this is where rights work is really good. Uh, and so he's showing it's, it, it is that that's absolutely this. So that's what Romans three twenty eight to three twenty nine is doing. You know, or is God the God of Jews only? He's not but also the God of the Gentiles. But the underlying issue that's there too is that it's the anthropological one that 
the Torah, i.e., you know, possessing the Torah, becoming a Jew, being part of the Jewish nation, it didn't actually solve the underlying anthropological problem. It didn't actually, it didn't actually fix the root issue. And so that is, if it's just about excluding the other, if it's just about, you know, kind of just the sort of universal argument, you know, why do you, why do you need something like Romans seven? Like, what is like, what is that? What is that doing there? And I think that, um, I guess you could say, because the way that right goes and ties, you know, the anthropological issue to what's happening with kind of the, the Jew Gentile debate and how being a Jew doesn't go and it doesn't, it doesn't solve the sin of Adam. It doesn't, it doesn't fix that, fix that condition. Um, I think that that is, uh, it's, it's, it's really, it's really helpful. And so, you know, right in his, in his works, you know, he's talked about, uh, that, you know, he kind of goes and says, look, uh, even his justification book, for example, he goes, like, look, stop, put down the old perspective versus new perspective thing. There's, there's important things that are on, you know, on, on both sides, which are, you know, biblically rooted. Um, and, you know, I think, I think that's right. And I think that, you know, it's, it's important I think, for the study that he does the most to in incorporate those, those anthropological concerns, which you see, you know, reflected similarly in folks like, you know, like Irenaeus and elsewhere and which, um, it, you know, uh, is, is recognized by other, you know, kind of old perspective people as well. And so I have a, I think there's a footnote toward, towards the end where I, 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 you know, talk about with, you know, Doug Moo and his, his reception of Wright's work, which is really interesting. And there's, and there's definitely places where Doug, as a, if you don't know Doug, he's a, he's, you know, he's a reformed, uh, you know, old perspective scholar, but one year I think does a lot of, he has a lot of independent thought and I've really enjoyed, you know, learning from him and corresponding with him about all this, this, this material. Uh, Cause I think he's got a lot, you know, of good, good insights. He, he at least kind of hints or suggests in a number of places that, you know, even though what Wright is saying isn't exactly what Calvin is saying as far as the way that their anthropological arguments work. Um, they, they're, they're not the same arguments themselves, but they do engage the same kind of issue. And if somebody from the old perspective, as Moose seems to suggest that he that he is, now I don't, I mean, we'd have, we'd have to call it Doug and see if he actually thinks that, you know, right in, engages the fullness of the anthropological issue, uh, you know, as, as you know, re re related to, to work salon and everything. Uh, which if you guys have his number, you can call him and we can get him on the line too. Uh, the, uh, he, 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 he sort of, he sort of hint, hints at that, you know, this seems to go into, to, 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 to do this. And if that is correct, then I, then I think that you have a, a really good point of correspondence, uh, you know, with those in the, in the reform tradition as well, because what, what Wright is saying there is also just what traditional Christianity says. It's also, it's again, use Piper's phrase, the, the wisdom of the centuries. Uh, it is, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's present here. That's, that's, that's the kind of stuff that they're saying. And so uh, it doesn't, you know, for, for some reform folks, uh, they, they look at, um, you know, they look at the new perspective and says, this just kind of seems like it's just making this, you know, the worst of the law thing, just a sociological issue. And I think that there's times that they're right. I think that, I, I just think there, there are at least some sort of new perspective voices that do, that do reduce it to just the sociological issue and don't incorporate the sort of the anthropological thing as much where it's like, yeah, it is about the Jew-Gentile debate, but that is also at the same time, the fact that just being part of the Jewish nation doesn't go and fix your heart. The Jews themselves, again, Deuteronomy 30, they still need the heart circumcision. That's what, you know, Jeremiah 31 is about. That's what, you know, Ezekiel what, 30, 36 is about. The Jews themselves are in much in need of redemption as any, any anybody else is. And now in Christ, this is happening and going and making both Jews and Gentiles into, into a new creation. So, uh, Anyway, let's just say I think I think that's I think that's right on. I think that there's there's material that's there um, where in areas where uh, you know the you know the new, new perspective you know folks at least some of them can 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 be somewhat chastened I think by this early, early material and uh, you know in, in general I think that uh, you know Wright's Wright's work probably among modern interpreters I think he does the, the best job of going putting all these pieces together in a way that uh, you know aligns with you know the early early centuries understood Paul, which is, again, if you're thinking from a reform perspective, at least, and this is an important distinction, I think, between Luther and, or at least for Luther and, and, you know, Calvin, Luther doesn't do the golden age thing. He doesn't go and say, hey, there is this early period of the church that you can go and appeal to 
when everything was, you know, was kind of great and rosy. Let's let's sort of go go back to that. It just he just it doesn't do that, and that's that's and you, that's reflected in his comments on the fathers. Calvin is is different there. Uh, if you read, uh, I mean, in a number of places, if you read the the one that always comes to mind for me is his letter to Satellite, where he keeps you know talking about we're just just trying to restore things to the ancient form of the church. This is, you know, which was later sort of, you know, messed up by all you terrible papists. Um, and and it, that's, it's a consistent appeal that's, that's there. And you see, you know, elsewhere, you know, he talks about there's a, a kind of golden era of, you know, five, the first 500 years of church history, for example, they'll go, go and talk about. And I think, you know, within, within, within you know, at least for those who, who follow Calvin's thought there, I think that if you want to take him seriously, then you, yeah, you, 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 you don't want to just dismiss out of hand you know, what the early church says here. And I, and I don't think that it's, um, I, I don't think it's insignificant that this early material was largely unavailable to Calvin. And I, and I kind of posit this, uh, you know, as, as a question at the end of the book, just as as an open question, one that I, I don't know the answer to is, you know, if he had access to patristic sources in a consistent way, you know, he, I believe it's halfway through his, his life, he goes and he, he uh, gets the writings of Irenaeus, but it doesn't seem like he has consistent access to uh, to material earlier than than Irenaeus, that's, that's closer to uh, you know to 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 Paul, and so I I I posit this just as an open question, you know, at the end, uh, you know, whether or not if he had access to to the earlier patristic writings, how this would have gone and informed his you know his understanding of what Paul is talking about in view of his high or because of his high view of the the you know of of the early tradition. Um, and, which I, again, I don't know. The, I don't know the answer to that, uh, but I think it's at least a question that's worth asking in relation to Calvin because of how seriously he wants to take that early tradition, which is is you could say distinct from Luther's posture most most days of the week. Uh, he's not always consistent there. Most most days days of the week, uh, Luther has a, a, a somewhat somewhat different posture. That's excellent. That's excellent. Yeah, I, I I really think that you're digging in a hole that's much more. Um, it's not as deep as um, the the ground that you know guys like James Dunn and and especially Sanders, they they kept emphasizing so much on the sociological aspect. But I see you you're you're not exactly following that line, um, and then you're also not following the line of uh, the pure, you know, that this is a, the medieval you know, uh, conscience issue. Um, I really like how you're trying to bridge the two. You could almost see the, the lines of agreements like, uh, Wright was seeing, maybe he saw that later. Cause the, la the last time I was really invested in, in, in studying, Wright, He wasn't emphasizing that as much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I, if I can just say, don't give me credit because I don't know anything. <laughs> I just, you know, I've, 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 you know, I've, I've spent, I spent, spent, you know, I spent years looking in this, this early material and trying to learn, you know, from the early sources as, you know, as best as I can to try to have, you know, my, my understanding, you know, informed by, you know, the sources were, you know, her, her, you know, her closest to, you know, Paul, Paul himself, and so. Uh, you know, if, if I have uh, anything useful that I have, I can guarantee you it's stolen. I have, <laughs> if you want to put it more generously, I borrowed it, but it's, it's all, it's all, it's all stolen, stolen material. So, uh, so, so, so there's that, uh, with, with what you note, actually, it's, it's funny. I have a, uh, I have a note in, in the, in the, in the book itself towards the, towards the, uh, I think it's in the, in the conclusion where I talk about how uh, it is really interesting. I, I believe it's in Wright's first published article. Um, he goes and he talks about, which I think, I think this might go back to the, go to, back to the sixties. Um, I can't remember the, the, the year on it, but it's his, his first published article. And he's talking about, um, the, uh, is it 60s? Well, I'm, I'm trying to remember the date now. I think it's 71. It could be 71. Uh, he, he's, he, you know, he's, he's giving sort of his exposition of what, Paul is talking about in, in Romans and what he, you know, what he means by, by, you know, all, all, all his materials here. Um, and then he goes and says, uh, you know, for those who are interested how Paul was read in the second century, this passage has very close links with Justin Martyr's dialogue with Trifo. Um, mm, yep. so he, I mean, he clearly, this is, I'm guessing this is when he was, you know, Oxford, he had gone through the dialogue and he's seen, boy, this is, 
what you know what he was you know as, as, a, as a you know young scholar was seeing at that point you can see the way that this aligned with you know second century you know Pauline interpretation here gosh it can't be 71 sorry that the year is the year is bothering me now it's got to be later <laughs> than that but i can't remember 78 maybe it could be 78. Um, yeah i was going to say it was it's a lot of you got to be later than that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i want to say 70 at least in tyndale Bull, bulletin um yeah, I remember which one you're talking about. Yeah. It got passed around a lot. Yep. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good article. I believe that it is a, uh, I believe it, it is from a an address. This, this actually might be the same one that is uh, when, because it's, it's it's funny because right, I think he was the one who uh, maybe unknowingly coined the phrase "new perspective" on Paul, and it was uh, I, I believe it was a lecture that he had given as a young scholar at Cambridge. Uh, yeah. That was that was in republished in Tyndale Tyndale Bulletin, and it had Jimmy Dunn sitting in the front row. Um, so it's funny how these how these world, worlds worlds converge. We had we had Jimmy Dunn came to our seminar in, in Oxford uh, a n number of times as well. So had a chance to to uh, bat things around him, uh, you know, with him for for a little bit, which is yeah, which is really really enjoyable. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. Yeah, I remember the two of them um, were talking once on a Q and A, and they were scuffling over who should be given the credit over the over the phrase the new you know the new perspective, and and boy. N.T. Wright was, he was like a lion. He's like, I am the one who coined it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's an excellent scholar. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully we can get him on here sooner or later. But I really appreciate your contribution to our show. Uh, we have a lot of Protestants. Uh, we have one particular Lutheran pastor who watches us occasionally. Hmm. And I'm hoping he gets a lot out of this. So hmm. thank you. And thank you again. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I, I am the beneficiary here in that I've like I said, you know, I, my understanding of, you know, of Paul and uh, how these pieces fit together theologically. Yeah. It's been, it's been, it's been, it's been, it's been yeah. It's been, it's been a pleasure, so. Dr. Thomas, I know you're you're uh, you, you've been going at this for a while, and and you had. I'll, I'll uh, party as long as you want to party, guys. I'm not well, gonna, we're we're going to wrap up here. Whole, I want to ask. Party. I want to ask you one question and then also give you one uh, chat question uh, from our audience. Oh, can so, I just as a, as a note? So I was supposed to give a shout out to my hype man, Mauricio Arroyo. And that's uh, whose question. I'm oh, yes. Yeah, 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 we know. Hey, look at that. <laughs> I was, I, he told me I had to go and mention that. And I, for, I forgot. I actually have never met Mauricio before, but he was the one who got all this. Always said, uh, yeah, he's my unofficial hype, hype man. And so he said, you <laughs> shout out. So there you go. Thank you. Definitely shout out to him because he, he uh, definitely uh, put this together. So thank you very much. And I'm going to ask his question here in just a second. Um, my last question was, um, you know, when, when you're talking about um, Irenaeus, I think it was, or actually, no, it, it may have been some of the uh, other individuals that are there in the second century. Hmm. You were mentioning in the book how um, in the early church, baptism and works of mercy are not necessarily uh, the kind of works of the law that Paul is talking about. In other words, these are not something that are uh, condemned as trying to merit favor in front of God. Can you maybe talk about that? What was their understanding in the second century of baptism? And works of mercy, you know, burying the dead and giving alms to the poor and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the best thing you can say is that none of those things are problematized in the way that they are in sort of later 16th century polemics. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, again, you just, uh, there is, as, as far as the, the, the problematizing, let's, like we, I guess here we can, you know, we can do a, a fun little kind of, uh, kind of pro, pro Luther, con Luther thing here. Uh, the way that the way that Luther goes and problematizes, you know, moral effort or you know, doing in general, as you're going to find in some of the old, old perspective language, uh, you just do not find any of that problematized with it within the early church. Uh, you just uh, again, those the kinds of dichotomies that that you find that you know characterize that that, that later period. Uh, you just you just don't don't see them there, and, and that is you know that is a, a, if you have a chance to go through the all of, all of the entire Luther's lectures on Galatians, it is interesting the way that. That is, um, you know, it really is problematized. Like that's the worst thing that you can try to do is to try to to, to, to save yourself. You go and you, you make yourself, uh, you know, you don't you don't just commit idolatry. You commit self idolatry because you're trying to make yourself into the savior by going and you know and performing all these all these good works. And so 
Um, I mean, whatever you think of that logic, it's at least really interesting. Uh, so you are the false messiah. You are the one who's gonna, you, you know, who comes and says, you know, I am he. Uh, to, you know, uh, the language from, from Matthew twenty four. Uh, so that 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 kind of stuff doesn't that you just don't find correspondence with with that. Um, you know, in, in the early period, which I think is, you know, I, my sense is that Luther probably recognized that as well. When it comes to baptism, baptism, Luther and baptism is really, really interesting. And I didn't have as much time within the book itself to get get in, into this. And so, of course, you know, baptism isn't isn't problematized. It's, you know, the way it's kind of the, the entrance in, into life. And you're going to find that, in, you know, in Justin, if you're looking at, you know, we talks about in the first apology with baptism as this kind of, you know, illumination that goes and happens or, you know, the words that you're going to answer. And yeah, it's really, really inter interesting. There's actually... Here, this is a spot where you're going to find more correspondence with a Lutheran understanding of baptism vis-a-vis, -vis, you can say, you know, a, Cal a Calvinist one. And it's fascinating the way in, in Luther that he goes and sort of fits baptism in. Because baptism is not a work of the law for Luther. It's just not, it's just not the way that, that, that it works. And so if you, if you read through... Uh, his lectures on Galatians, he has, he has these fascinating, um, uh, these fascinating statements where he goes and he says, you know, if anyone denies, as the fanatics do, that as soon as somebody is baptized, that, you know, they are granted salvation, then what you are doing is you are attributing salvation to works. Just not, wow. How does that, how does that work? If you don't believe that baptism goes and actually affects salvation in you, then you believe that it must come by some other way. It must come by come by works then. And so it's really interesting within within Luther's thought, uh, and and because I mean he you know you kind of have this sort of fam famous Luth Lutheran either ors and dichotomies and things like that, which kind of leads you to you know I don't know you, you can take either Paul or James for for example use one one uh, one, one famous one. Uh, it's really interesting in Luther's thought how baptism he still sees as being, you know, salvifically you know, efficacious. It goes and it it it, 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 it does that. And so it, he he sort of shoehorns it into faith. Um, I think I think it's and, and I mean I would I, I, your, your Lutheran pastor friend have him send send me an, an email let me know because you know I'd love I'd love to hear. Uh, you know what he thinks is again. I I've spent a lot a lot of time in Luther. I love learning about his thought, but I can always go and learn more. It seems to me that baptism does belong under faith for Luther. Faith is baptism. Baptism is faith. Uh, it's baptism is just so so prominent in, in his theology. And baptism goes and sort of uh, what you know what faith says. Baptism goes goes and does. Um, and uh, and it's not in the works of the law category. And so that would be a spot where you could say the way that sort of baptism is kind of this exception uh, for uh, for Luther, that uh, you know that would be similar to the to the early church as well as far as the way that they you know they end up don't understand baptism as a work of the law either. Whereas for for Calvin, again I've I, I've come across different you know reform things that are different things for for Calvin as far as what he thinks baptism actually is and does and how how it goes and goes and matters, um, but it. It doesn't seem as though it's it's quite quite the same same thing. And I think that when you kind of look in the succeeding tradition of sort of your your Lutheran and Reformed polemics against each other, and as far as the nature of baptism, baptismal regeneration, or even contemporary sort of kind of popular, uh, you know, evangelical slash you know Reformed critiques of, of Luther on baptism, I think that they often go and reflect you know, reflect that that you know Luther still believes in this kind of magical mystical baptism thing, uh, which uh, you know. Uh, a, a good a good Protestant with a good theology of justification shouldn't shouldn't go and, and hold to, which is I just I find all those all those discussions to be really really interesting. I, I think they probably say more about us than they, than they do about, yeah. <laughs> about, about 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 Luther. So that's true. <laughs> you know, I'm glad you did this on the reception in the second century, just because when I read the Apostolic Fathers, that. That's when I just said, okay, I'm done. Um, I, I can't be Protestant anymore because when I read them, they're so close to the apostles and it just seems so far removed from anything that I was seeing uh, from Protestantism. So I was glad that you addressed their reception 
of this. So I really want to encourage everybody to get the book. Again, it's Paul's Works of the Law and the Perspective of Second Century Reception. And before we go, I want to ask Mauricio's question. He asked this, what would you say to a Protestant who insists that Paul's use of the works of the law is both moral and ceremonial, which encompass, uh, which would encompass any and all good works? This seems to be the basis for their doctrine of sola fide. What do you think of that? What's the question? You, you know, on the, I guess you could say from a, from a theological standpoint, you, you, can, you can kind of take this, hey, what's actually going on in the texts themselves? Mm -hmm. But you can also just say, you know, kind of abstract it more broadly theologically. And, and if you're going to do that, I don't think that if, if you're talking about, hey, what is, what is the source of our salvation? Is the source of our salvation any, any works at all? No, of course not. <laughs> it's like it's like you can't really ask a dumber question than that. Um, that that this the source of, of God's saving grace is not anything that we perform on our own. It's 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 God. And he's he's the one who goes goes and does that. He is the one, you know, who, who writes his law on our on our hearts. And so, you know, theologically, I think that if you want to go into, you know, say, hey from a standpoint of at least, you know, initial justification, as far as us going and receiving God's justifying grace in our lives, man, I'm, absolutely. It's not like, I don't know, I guess you could say, it's not like, you know, Seneca goes and obeys, uh, you know, the moral law as best as he can. And, and so then, you know, God says, boy, Seneca, you're doing a great job. Here's your justifying grace. Uh, I mean, we can talk about the salvation of Seneca or fill in the blank as much as we want. That's kind of a different question. But uh, I, Again, I, I don't think that that's that's the way that it goes go, go, goes goes and goes and works. Um, the question then is how does how does that relate to final justification? And here I, I, I find the the work of people like you know like like John Barclay uh, to to be really helpful. I mean, I, I cite, cite him uh, you know in in, in the in the, in the preface of the book. He was actually the, one of the examiners for for the dissertation. And um, just somebody who whose work I've, I've benefited from a great a great deal. So he talks about how, you know, for for Paul, God's grace is unconditioned but not unconditional. It is unconditioned but not unconditional. It's unconditioned in the sense that it comes without any sort of prerequisites. You don't have to be, you know, you don't it's, it's the, you don't you don't have to have any kind of condition to go and to go and receive it. Um, and if you boy, if you think about that, you just think back to Jesus' own ministry and hanging out with you know, tax collectors and sinners and, you know, Zacchaeus, who was a terrible guy and, you know, Matthew, who was a terrible guy with a great name and stuff like that, you know, that you look at all that stuff and, you know, that's, that's, that, I think that's, that, that goes back to Jesus' own, you know, ministry itself. It's, it's unconditioned, but it's not unconditional. There is precisely because God's grace is transformative. It goes and it creates a new set of conditions, a new set of obligations that the believer is meant to follow, who is now empowered by the Holy Spirit. So, I mean, there's all kinds of places you can, I mean, uh, you know, if, you know, if uh, you know, if if by the Spirit you put you put to death, you know, the, the deeds of the flesh, you know, you will live. Uh, the, the kinds of stuff that you get in Romans six, Romans eight, uh, you know, the judgment material you get in Romans two fourteen. Um, but really, you can kind of point to all over in Paul, all over in, you know, in, uh, you know, the rest of the New Testament as well. Um, it, there, is still, there are still conditions for those who have received grace. And, and here I think that, that John's work, uh, so this John, John Barclay, and, and looking at the way that grace language goes and works in, you know, in, in you know, the greco Roman context and saying, you know, what grace does, it establishes a relationship of reciprocity. Um, it's not just like, okay, here's this disinterested gift. See, see you later. But no, it, it actually goes and it establishes a relationship, but there's a back and forth that's in that relationship. Uh, Barclay's work is really helpful on this. Um, the, uh, uh, David De Silva's work on, on this is really, really good, good as well. So I think those are, those are both fan fantastic, you know, re resources. So if, you know, if, if one, if one wants to go and say, Hey, works a lot, you know, it includes, includes moral works as well. Well, at least when it comes to you know initial justification, I think that's that's fine to go into to you know say that because again you know moral works aren't the source of God's saving power. Uh, you know, if you want to use the the language from from Origin, which this is kind of the one thing in uh, in Origin that Luther likes, you know, where it says you know you know kind of faith being like the root 
of you know of uh, you know of our, of our justification and good works being the fruit of it. Um, it it's it's not that it's not that the, the fruit is itself the source or that we have to sort of produce the stuff in advance. Having said that, there is still a new set of obligations that God goes and makes by His grace that those who are within the new covenant who have you know received the power of the Holy Spirit are intended to go and to you know to, to produce in their in their lives. And so if you read through the book, you know, the book, I have a lot of examples of you know of, of that on uh, the way that that that'll that all goes and works. So if you want to say, hey, how can we go and kind of build common ground? I think that's a that's a helpful way to go and to do it. Again, having said that, even even with that, you're just saying, but what what actually does works of the law mean in context? If you are looking at, you know, looking at it in its historical context, and you're looking at the early reception there. It does seem to be focusing on the Torah, on these practices of the Torah, and not the sort of individualistic, you know, did I do, do I do enough works? Which works are going to go and justify me, et cetera? It seems to be the question of do we have to go and become Jews or not? Do we have to go and to participate in in the markers of the you know of of, of this this you know the the the, na the nation of Israel? And uh, you know the answer I think in uh, in, in three twenty in Romans three twenty nine is pretty clear, uh, you know, or is God the God of the Jews only? Is He not also the God of the Gentiles? As far as what's the import of having to go and you know if you are just by the works of law, what what would that mean? Well, it would mean that God is the God of the Jews only, i.e., works of the law is the thing that makes makes you a Jew. And the answer is no, God is not the God of the Jews only. He is the God of the Gentiles also, because there's only one God. It's not like we Jews have one God and they, you know, they worship Zeus and this guy over here worships a hat or whatever. It's like, no, there's only one God in the whole, in the whole, in the whole world. And we are the ones who say that we have the Shema. If you believe the Shema, then you should, you should go and know this. So there's only one God who's going to, you know, justify both the Gentiles and, 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 you know, and, and, and the Jews by his grace. So uh, I, I just think both, both the context of Paul's letters, as far as, you know, if you want to use Galatians as well, talking about the law that came 430 years afterwards. Uh, and then, you know, again, here, in, uh, you know, in, in, in Romans, uh, it really seems like this is what it is. Even if you, even if you want to go into looking in terms of moral works, and, and, and again, there's something that's, I think, if you, if you want to talk about the Augustinian transposition, and what he goes and does, you know, in the context of the Pelagian controversy, and you want to read the text that, that way, there's still, you know, there's still valuable material that's 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 there. Uh, as long as I think, you know, I, and and I, and I think that you know what what uh, what John goes and says about the 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 unconditioned but not unconditional stuff that that mer that that maps perfectly onto onto Augustine as well. So there's, you know, I guess there's no no issue that's 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 there. Dr. Thomas, I want to thank you so much for coming on. This has been excellent. I have a million other questions, but maybe we can do a part two. Hey, um, yeah, whatever, whatever you guys want to do. I love, love, love sharing things. I love, I'm I love to do it. Time, so. Maybe even a round table and we could talk about uh, the works of the law further and, you know, other issues that are related to justification. Again, I want to urge everybody to go to Amazon.com or InterVarsity Press. In fact, I think InterVarsity Press uh, is having a discount. So if you go to the website, get uh, this. Paul's works of the law in the perspective of second century reception, again, by Dr. Matthew J. Thomas. Your beard got a lot cooler there. What's that? Well, when you, when you held the book up, your beard got a lot more impressive all of a sudden. St. <laughs> uh, Paul has a very, very impressive beard in that, in that cover. It's pretty, it's, pretty, it's pretty fantastic. The, the only way I can ever have anything closely resembling a beard, or even vaguely resembling a beard, is by holding the book in front of my face, because I just can't go facial hair for some reason. I need to trim mine. It's it's starting to get to that point when you, when you let it grow out uh, thick enough, it gets itchy. So, yeah, it's so I've, never had, right now, so. I've never had that problem. My facial hair, it, I just turn into a porcupine. It doesn't <laughs> actually, it just goes in straight lines. And so I, I, it just gets to a point where my wife just says, please don't, don't do this to yourself. Don't do this to me. Don't do this to the kids. You know, your face goes and, you know, scratches the kids and they end up, you know, bleeding and stuff. So yeah, I, so again, this is, this is, this is, you can teach me about this on the next, uh, you know, the next session we have. How do you, how do you grow a beard? Because I clearly know nothing. That's probably the only thing I could teach you. <laughs>
<laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> I love it. Anyways, thank you so much for coming on. Y'all thank y'all for participating there in the chat. It, it's been excellent. Um, and don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. Share this on your social media. Again, go check out the book at InterVarsity Press. I put the link in the description, so just click on that. And also check us out at patreon.com forward slash reason in theology if you would like to support what we're doing. Till next time, God bless you all.